Uh, good afternoon. I'm uh, Daniel Smirov. Uh, I'm fellow at uh, CAS. And uh, I uh, actually lead a seminar which is called uh, The Politics of the Rule of Law. And as a convener of this seminar, I have uh, enormous pleasure to welcome uh, Professor Mikhail Erechuk uh, from Ukraine uh, to give us a lecture on playing with the rules, democracy and the rule of law uh, in Ukraine. Apart from the fact that uh, this is a title which fits perfectly with uh, our seminar, it promises to be a, a very interesting and enlightening uh, talk on a subject of uh, enormous uh, importance. Uh, Professor Rybchuk is a famous uh, intellectual, Ukrainian intellectual. He has an illustrious uh, career. Uh, starting from uh, the times of uh, communism, uh, where he managed uh, to uh, get expelled from uh, the <laughs> university <laughs> for, uh, for uh, <coughs> publishing uh, uh, texts, some is that, famous some is that uh, texts, uh, which uh, at that time was a punishable offense. Now it's a little bit difficult to explain uh, to, to students, how come that for literary texts even you can uh, get expelled from uh, from uh, university, but Professor Rubchuk uh, can uh, explain by example <laughs> such <laughs> happenings. Uh, well, uh, apart from that, uh, actually Professor Rubchuk uh, uh, has uh, written a lot on the issues of uh, Ukrainian uh, democracy and Ukrainian identity. Uh, both of these uh, problems, uh, as I said, are uh, of key importance uh, for politics in uh, Eastern Europe and uh, probably even uh, beyond the region of uh, Eastern Europe. Uh, so I really look forward with uh, uh, great interest to uh, your lecture and uh, give you the floor. So please, Professor. Thank you very much for this. Um uh, nice introduction and thank you very much for inviting me here. I've never been to, to, to Bulgaria, to Sofia, and it's really a very, 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 very good experience. Thank you. Uh, the topic which I uh, uh, offered to, 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 to be presented here, uh, of course, it relates to many different things, but uh, first of all, first of all, um, uh, to two main main issues which uh, are of primary interest for myself, uh, democracy building, and uh, uh, of course uh, rule of law is a substantial part of it. And I hope that, I presume that not, not, every, uh, not anybody requires here any information about Ukraine, because you, you, we are on the same continent and uh, presumably you know where the country is. So uh, I, I place this map not to, to show you where Ukraine is located, but just to to remind you that uh, there are a lot of, of post-communist states, uh, up to well, more than 2,000 uh, states in Eurasia, so-called Eurasia. And uh, if you um, take a look at the um, trajectory of development of all of them after communism, they, uh, Ukraine uh, would be placed in the middle, uh, between the most successful states and between the least successful states. So it's, country which is uh, neither, neither a success story nor a complete failure. It's still struggling, struggling, uh, fledgling democracy, as, uh, as you put it. So uh, if you, uh, if you uh, compare, for, I try to compare Ukraine with Bulgaria uh, in terms of democracy. It's easy to do because we have annual uh, democracy reports by Freedom House, we have uh, democracy scores. Uh, and the democracy, the general democracy score is uh, made up from different, from separate, uh, in, different, in, separate in different separate fields, five different fields. Uh, so you can see that uh, these countries belong to different groups. Uh, Bulgaria is considered so-called float democracy and Ukraine is hybrid regime. Uh, it's uh, not a shame to be float democracy because there are only 20 countries which are qualified as, as full democracy. Countries which have which have uh, scores between eight and uh, and ten, it's maximum uh, maximum ten uh, points. 
and there are only 20 states. Probably Scandinavian states, Canada, Australia, New Zealand. So America is not there. America is also top of four democracies. So don't don't uh, don't be embarrassed to belong to this group. Uh, what is what is interesting is that Ukraine, uh, in most um, in most terms, uh, is not so far from Bulgaria, especially in, in terms of political participation, uh, civil liberties. In terms of political culture, it's even uh, assessed even higher, probably because of. Uh, I presume that because of um, civic mobilization during the war, we have quite a, quite a vibrant civil society in Ukraine, and probably it's, it's reflected here. Where Ukraine lags behind uh, uh, Bulgaria is, of course, functioning of government and electoral process. Maybe not so much pluralism, pluralism Ukraine is quite a pluralistic state, but electoral process and functioning of government. In these two, two terms, Ukraine is far, far, lagging far behind. Uh, if this, there was not so, so poor performance in function of government, Ukraine would probably belong also to flawed democracies because it, uh, flawed democracies are countries uh, which have uh, the democracy score between 6 and 8. So in this case, Ukraine would have more than 6 and it would obviously belong to, the, uh, to flawed democracy as well. But, you know, this very, very poor score in function of government makes Ukraine a hybrid regime. Uh, in both cases, uh, this deficiency relates to rule of law. Ukraine, uh, we can put it semi-jokingly, Ukraine is democracy without rule of law. And this is a huge problem for the country. Uh, this is actually what made, made, uh, made Ukraine uh, belong into this uh, hybrid group. Um, it's actually not the last country within this group, among post-communist states, because uh, Macedonia performs worse, uh, um, of course, Kosovo and Bosnia and Herzegovina, they are below Ukraine. But basically, Ukraine one, one is of one among the lagers uh, in, in European part of post communist world. Uh, so, uh, we, we, can, we can see clearly here that rule of law is a real problem, and rule of law really makes Ukraine uh, much, much more backward in, in terms of democratic development than it really is, because it's quite, quite pluralistic state, but uh, dysfunctional. Uh, so um, I try uh, further to, uh, to um, examine uh, why uh, this problem emerges and, and perhaps how to fix it, if, it, if it's possible to fix it at all. Uh, so um, uh, hybrid regimes are defined as, as following. Uh, I, I wouldn't uh, go deeper into it, but it's general general idea of hybrid regimes is that it's neither neither dictatorial nor clearly democratic state. It's something in between. Uh, they have all the attributes of uh, democratic political life. They have political space for opposition. They have opposition parties and the parliament and uh, civil society. They have quite quite competitive uh, political process, elections. But uh, they suffer from very serious democratic deficit and uh, many problems are listed here. Poor representation of citizens' interests, low level uh, of political participation beyond voting, uh, frequent abuse of law by government officials. I would uh, tell you more about this. Elections of unsettled legitimacy, and this is why all the time they are questioned and disputed um, in Ukraine, and a very low <coughs> level of public confidence in state institutions. The most remarkable thing is uh, the lowest uh, confidence uh, is for uh, law enforcement institutions. They are the worst. They, they, uh, they evoke the, the, le the, 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 last, the least trust uh, non citizens. Um, so, um, uh, you, can, you can describe this dysfunctional democracy like this. Democracy without rule of law is like democracy, but it cannot, it cannot drive. If you try to, to drive this uh, car, it uh, goes nowhere. Just you know, try, to, <laughs> try to move it. It's cutting from the internet. It's about our parliament. The Kodarada is the uh, Supreme Council, it's the Ukraine parliament. It's ready, ready for work. It's how, how cartoonist, uh, it's quite popular image of Ukraine parliament. Uh, so, uh, Ukrainian democracy uh, can uh, very often is defined as, as a uh, pluralism by default. I, I like this formula very much. It uh, belongs to Lincoln Way, um, published first in his uh, article, but then also in, in his book with uh, Levitsky. Um, so, uh, pluralism by default, it's a very good definition of uh, 
um, uh, system which uh, exists in Ukraine, it's institutionalized political competition, uh, which survives not because leaders are especially democratic or because societal actors are particularly strong, but because the government is too fragmented and the state too weak to impose authoritarian rule in a democratic international context. I, I compare this to uh, two boxers who are clinched and they cannot, cannot knock down each other. Neither government, which tends to be authoritarian, nor civil society, which uh, tries to, to democratize the state. But neither of them is strong enough to, to enforce uh, their program uh, and will. So it's kind of, of uh, societal clinch. Uh, but what is interesting uh, that uh, I, I, I believe it's, uh, the, the last remark is important, the same state weakness and governmental fragmentation that promotes pluralism also undermines effective governance and uh, may ultimately threaten long-term democratic consolidation. So it's, uh, it's um, uh, two sides of the same coin. On one hand, it's, uh, this uh, pluralism uh, by default it supports, uh, supports pluralism, but also it prevents any uh, consolidation of, of uh, institution, I would say institution institutionalization of, of uh, this pluralistic system and transformation in, into a genuine democracy. Uh, so, uh, 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 I promised you to, to, to show uh, in more detail this uh, post-communist states. And here are uh, more than, I, I, I told you, more than two, two dozen post-communist states. It's difficult to count because some of them uh, disappeared like East Germany, some of them emerged like Kosovo, so it's, we are never certain how many, how many there they are, like 28, yeah, let's, let's say 28. And of course they had very different trajectories of uh, development since uh, the fall of communism. Um, uh, obviously um, the most successful countries belong to uh, Central and uh, Central East Europe. Uh, maybe starting from Croatia and uh, Slovenia and on Hungary, Czech Republic and Baltic Republics. Uh, the least successful in terms of transition, transformation uh, countries belong to Central Asia and uh, countries in the middle are countries from Balkans and uh, European part of the former Soviet Union. Uh, there are many, many explanations for this, uh, most of them are of uh, kind of classical character. Uh, here's um, a diagram which shows um, uh, transformation of the states in terms of, of consolidation of democratic system. <coughs> it's, uh, it's limited uh, only uh, for years 1997 uh, 2003, but you can easily extrapolate uh, and extend this uh, diagram. It would be more or less the same. What is interesting here is that um, when co communism collapsed, um, some states uh, jumped immediately to the high level, to, to the level of uh, unconsolidated democracy, the states uh, of Central East Europe, which uh, eventually became members of the European Union. Uh, some other states, they virtually didn't change, states of Central Asia, they, there was no, no civil society or virtually no civil society, and gradually they declined. So, it's absolutely, absolutely clear and obvious what, what occurred within these two, two groups. Uh, Central East European states, they, they jumped high and they gradually consolidated their democratic system. And Central Asian states, they remained low and they further declined. They consolidated their authoritarian system, which was uh, slightly loosened by Gorbachev's perestroika, but ultimately it's, uh, it was re-established <coughs> uh, very authoritarian, especially in Turkmenistan, which is a completely totalitarian state. The most interesting is, of course, this middle part of, um, uh, of the group uh, of post-communist states, uh, which consists of uh, so-called, uh, they, they mark here as EU candidate states, but it relates to Bulgaria and, and Romania, so-called Eastern Balkan states, Western Balkan states here, and uh, European republics of the former Soviet Union. They, you know, uh, after uh, the collapse of the Soviet Union, they, uh, um, uh, they jumped, but more or less to the same level level which uh, actually reflected this hybridity because uh, neither civil society was strong enough like here to completely overcome uh, the old ancien regime and to replace all the institutions to introduce completely new rules of game no, nor the state authoritarian state was strong enough to completely suppress civil society <coughs> and to, to continue the business as usual like like here like like in Central Asia here uh, all the states had a, had a kind of 
of compromise between ancien regime and uh, democratic forces. Different kinds of compromises, different kinds of, of uh, cooperation, uh, cooptation of opposition, uh, uh, and, and so on. Um, but gradually, trajectories of these states diverged. Uh, Balkan states gradually uh, moved up into the uh, direction of consolidation, very, very slow, very incoherent, inconsistent, but consolidation of democratic systems, while uh, um, post-Soviet republics of the European part of the former Soviet Union fell down. In, uh, so I, I would say uh, authoritarian, authoritarian regime was reconsolidated there. Why is this, uh, okay, why is this different uh, trajectories, um, uh, how, how they can be explained? Because it's more or less clear here on the top and on the bottom. It's, it's quite, quite clear story. There are two different forces, and uh, opposition wins, civil society is strong enough, uh, a, complete, a complete reset of state institutions, of everything, and complete conservation, preservation of ancien regime under new guises uh, and so on. But here it's, it's very, very interesting story, and of course Ukraine belongs to this group, as well as Bulgaria, actually. Um, so what happened there? Um, this is just an illustration of, of actually the same, uh, the same diagram, but uh, based on different, uh, different scores from different um, uh, evaluation, different assessments. It belongs to the so-called uh, we, we, we democracy. Uh, again, you can see here how, um, how Baltic states and the same relates also to Central European states, how they jumped uh, up after the fall of communism, and they gradually developed this you know, consolidated democratic regime. Uh, something like this occurred with the Balkan states, um, but uh, everywhere else, uh, especially in, in former Soviet Union, in Eastern, uh, in Soviet republics of the former Soviet Union, you know, we observed this you know, decline. Ukraine belonged to this group, and you can see that nothing happened in Central Asia. It was very low, and it remains very low. Uh, Ukraine belongs to this uh, group of the um, former Soviet republics, uh, European uh, republics of the so so Soviet Union. They are very different, I must say. Here they are packed within one group, uh, but actually, if you take uh, carefully, actually, it's the same relates also to Balkan states, they are very, also very different. Uh, so, uh, I'll try to go a little bit into details. Um, there are some explanations for these different trajectories. Uh, I believe that they are quite clear um, because they are kind of, of classical explanations. Uh, first of all, of course, civilizational legally because uh, legacy because we know that the most successful states, post-communist states, in terms of transformation, are states of uh, which belongs to realm of Western Christianity, either Protestant or Catholic. Um, Eastern Christianity states are less successful and uh, Central Asian states are complete, uh, completely unsuccessful in terms of democratization. But also, uh, it, can be also uh, it can also relate to uh, political legacy, not only uh, civilizational but uh, also political, because uh, again, this, you know, uh, Central East European states, they belong to uh, Austrian or German empires while uh, Balkan and uh, post-Soviet states belong to Russian or Ottoman, which also had very, very different kind of institutions, uh, specifically in terms of, of uh, um, limitation of power and uh, pluralism and so on. And there are many other factors which were <coughs> specific for each country, like neighborhood, like uh, uh, natural resources, uh, social structure, elite civil society, internal divides. I'll tell you more about internal divides because, because it's very important in case of Ukraine. And of course, a kind of, of transition which had to be completed. Either it was single, uh, there was no single in post communist states, either double or triple or uh, quadruple, uh, because double transition stands for democratization and uh, marketization, which was quite uh, difficult transition for Poland, for, for Hungary, um, uh, or triple, which involves also um, state building, not only democratization and uh, marketization, but also state building. Uh, countries like, you know, like uh, Slovakia or um, uh, Macedonia, they never had any statehood before. Uh, or even uh, quadruple transition, which, which involves also nation building, which is the case of Belarus, of Ukraine, of Macedonia, actually, and, and so on. So, of course, if you have a political transition, obviously it's much more complicated than double transition, you, because you have to, to solve many more problems. 
And what is also interesting here is that um, the government uh, apparently is more interested to, to focus his attention on state nation building rather than democratization. It's, you know, so it's, it also provides a sort of excuse for uh, authoritarian or would-be authoritarian governments to, to ignore democratic agenda, democratization agenda, but to pay more attention to this consolidation of um, authoritarianism under pretext of strengthening of, of the state. Um, uh, so uh, here is a list of um, other factors which influenced uh, transition. Um, of course, uh, external agents are very important uh, because um, in the case of the Balkan states, uh, external influence was prim primarily Western. And uh, I believe that both NATO and, uh, and European Union play a very important role in gradual consolidation of institutions, of democracy here in, in, in the Balkans. While in uh, post-Soviet republics, of course, influence uh, of the West was much weaker. Uh, while Russian influence was, was much more stronger and this played a rather negative role. This might be one of more, one of reasons why these trajectories of Balkan states and post-Soviet republics, European post-Soviet republics, diverged. Uh, also, as I mentioned, uh, the, the crucial factor was internal divides. This largely explains why uh, Ukraine and Moldova different are different from Belarus and Russia. I'll tell you a little more, more about this uh, later. Uh, and uh, this is another story about feckless pluralism. I can, I can probably skip it. Uh, just another definition of the same pluralism by default. Uh, the, the previous one belonged to Luke and Bay, and this belongs to Thomas Karozas, who, uh, who defines also the system which exists in Ukraine as feckless pluralism, uh, which is important here that um, State remains persistently weak. This kind of, of political competition and even trade of uh, power from one hand from authorities to opposition and vice versa, but still it doesn't change much. And of course, uh, people are gradually tired with this because you know democracy with, uh, without rule of law, without firm, uh, which is not firmly uh, firmly institutionalized, is uh, uh, very uh, exhaustive for for common people. Uh, so, um, uh, sooner or later, people, uh, when, when they are tied with this uh, feckless pluralism, they, sooner or later, they vote democratically, they vote for some strong hand, for some authoritarian rulers, and um, this is actually what happened in, in Belarus, what happened in Russia, both dictators were elected democratically there. Majority supported Lukashenko, majority supported Mr. Putin, and still supports both of them. Presumably, uh, just because they, they, they were fed up with the previous uh, democracy without rule of law, a democracy which was factless, which was absolutely dysfunctional, uh, so they uh, opted for, for some sort of uh, autocracy, but with more, more or less predictable uh, rules of game. Um, and uh, this is another description of, of this system which uh, may emerge instead of factless pluralism. Thomas Karozas calls it dominant power politics, uh, which also mm, is not quite quite uh, dictatorial because they have some sort of political competitions. They have uh, legally registered opposition parties, and some of them even sneak into the parliament. It happens, um, but but still, it's uh, the, the most important thing is that the power cannot be changed peacefully. There, there are no mechanisms to to transfer power from government. Uh, from incumbents to opposition. It's absolutely impossible. It, it, it's excluded. Uh, so the, well, this is maybe another illustration for this um, uh, system and also, also illustration for playing these rules because it very, very, very well illustrates how such regimes uh, play, uh, play with, with rules. Like formally, technically speaking, everything was, uh, you remember this gambit, uh, in 2012, there was no violation of law, basically, but still we understand it was a trick. And of course, Russia is not uh, exceptional here because we have been no, uh, we have a lot of such things in Ukraine. Uh, you remember a recent story when um, uh, president's uh, ally had to become a prosecutor, and they changed the entire law in order to, uh, to, to, in order for him to become eligible for this position. 
because there was a requirement of uh, <coughs> legal education and something like this. And, and the entire law was changed and this requirement was cancelled just in order to, to make a good friend of president and prose the general prosecutor of, of the country. That's absolutely... Uh, again, no, no law was violated, but he understand that he was uh, playing with the rules. Actually, the entire formula um, comes from a statement uh, made uh, by Javier Sol Solana back in 2012 uh, at the time he was uh, 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 Secretary of uh, European Union, uh, he advised Ukrainian rulers, uh, Leonid Kushma president was at the time, he advised them uh, to play uh, by the rules and not with the rules. And this is what actually they are still doing. So there are a lot of, of examples of such uh, games. I wouldn't uh, bother you with these examples. You understand what's, uh, what the story is about. Um, actually, the recent example, uh, under strong uh, international pressure, Ukraine parliament passed uh, uh, you know, international and domestic pressure from civil society. They finally passed this law about anti-corruption law, which is welcome, but, uh, but they uh, secretly, without discussion, introduced one more clause, small, very, clause, very small clause into this law, which was not discussed, which was not just read in the, during this uh, parliamentary debate. It, it appeared in the text uh, ultimately. This small clause which may uh, undermine the entire, the entire business. Uh, clause which uh, stipulates that uh, all the criminal cases which, which were uh, already pending, uh, they are not uh, subject for this you know, new, newly created uh, um, uh, anti-corruption court. So, which means that these cases can be considered by the old, these regular courts, which uh, gives very good chance for these uh, high-ranking officials who are now under investigation to escape any punishment because uh, old courts are very, very heavily corrupt. The new courts, anti-corruption courts, is supposed to be uh, clean. There are many mechanisms which, to prevent it from, from corruption. So, uh, I don't know how the story will end because again we have it was a scandal because of this amendment in the law and maybe maybe it will be uh, abolished this amendment in the law but still it's a very also very graphical example of how how the old system resists and how they still try to play these rules it's, it's like basic instincts you know they just cannot give up um, well so um, uh, this you know. Um, stage, which is not based on the rule of law, uh, is uh, very efficient in a way, because it's a kind of new, new type of authoritarianism, which is very different from what we had under the communism, when uh, there was very rigid ideology and uh, you know, all, any dissent was uh, persecuted by KGB, and etc. Et Here there is no rigid, no ideology, you can do whatever you wish, you can say almost everything. But they developed probably spontaneously. It was no, there was no special design. There was no premeditation. They just uh, spontaneously developed very, very efficient system of control. Uh, Kit Darden defined it uh, very aptly as a black man state. I, I like this formula very much because it explains the essence of this type of, of regimes. Um, black man state uh, is based on three uh, major pillars. Um, first pillar is uh, corruption, widespread corruption. Corruption is not uh, it's even encouraged, it's tolerated by the government, even encouraged uh, by the government. Because everybody is corrupted, so everybody is on the hook. And everybody can be uh, persecuted. So, uh, first pillar is corruption. <coughs> Second pillar is uh, surveillance. Corruption is tolerated but not uh, forgiven. Uh, it's, uh, it's observed, and uh, you know all the cases are carefully monitored, and uh, compromat is collected, and uh, so there are a lot of folders as compromat against everybody. And finally, the third pillar, which is the most important, is selective application of law, which is a very old principle. Yeah, uh, everything, everything for my friends, and uh, the law for my enemies. Yeah, it's, probably comes from Mexican uh, president of 19, late 19th century to early 20th century. Uh, it's nothing new under, under the sun. Um, so, you know, this selective application of law is, is very efficient because, you know, anybody can be brought uh, to court without any political, nothing, no, no, you know, no politics. It's just, you know, just business, you know. Uh, it was a case of Khodorkovsky, it was a case of uh, Pablo Zarenko, you may, maybe know, who was Prime Minister of Ukraine in 19, late uh, mid-90s. 
uh, it was the case of Yulia Timoshenko actually twice uh, because she was uh, imprisoned by Kurchma and then by Yanukovych and maybe she will be imprisoned once again, I don't know, we will see. <coughs> there, are, there are a lot of reasons to do, because really there were very serious uh, uh, violations of law. But of, everybody understands that she and other people were not imprisoned because of, of this uh, violation, but because of something else, because of political competition. And uh, so, you know, this system looks very, very, very stable. You know, technically speaking, you know, the government which uh, uh, learned how to operate the system can be very stable. They can selectively, selectively penalize uh, opponents and exclude them from, from political process. It's very, very good, very manageable uh, quasi-democracy, imitation of democracy. Um, but, but still, you know, uh, this system which appeared to be quite successful um, in uh, Russia and Belarus and elsewhere, it failed, uh, or appeared, not, appeared to be not so successful in Ukraine and, by the way, in Moldova. These two countries, uh, if you take a look at the former Soviet Union, this European part of the Soviet Union, there is substantial difference between Russia and Belarus on one hand and Ukraine and Moldova on the other hand. So why, why the difference? Uh, because we, yeah, we can understand the difference between you know, Ukraine and Poland or Ukraine and, and Kazakhstan. Okay, it's, 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 it's clear. But why these states are so different? Um, of course, we can speak here about different Western uh, legacy in, in this state. Because, of course, the Ukraine and Moldova were exposed to Western influences more than Belarus or, say, Russia. Uh, Moldova was part of Romania, Ukraine was part of, of Habsburg Empire and of Poland for many centuries. So, of course, they have uh, different experience. Uh, and many and more contacts and so on. Also, they did not internalize so much this pan Slavonic anti Westernism which is very characteristic for, for, for Russian messianistic uh, ideology and which was um, uncritically accepted by uh, Belarusians and many Ukrainians, by the way, but still it's not so, so much as, uh, as it was the case in, in, in Russia. Uh, but uh, probably the most important uh, factor was, of course, identity split in both Ukraine and Moldova. Split which does not exist in so, so deep, so fundamental in Russia or Belarus. In Ukraine and Moldova, uh, this identity split provides opposition with very firm uh, electoral base. Not only opposition, but also uh, authorities who may become opposition, they also can rely on some very, very, very strong uh, electoral base. So whoever is in power, opposition would have some, you know, stable electoral. And this make, make uh, country actually too realistic by default. This is what Lukan uh, insists in. Furman, maybe you know this, uh, this name, Dmitry Furman, which was quite prominent Russian uh, political um, uh, scientist. He died a few years ago, unfortunately. Uh, as early as in 1997, he uh, very perspicaciously, I would say, predicted this, you know, uh, better chances of Ukraine for um, kind of pay breakthrough in terms of uh, democratic development. He didn't discuss uh, Moldova. Moldova is probably too, too minor, uh, too small uh, piece of land. Uh, which it was beyond his attention. But he discussed these three uh, East Slavonic republics, Ukraine, Russia, and Belarus. And he tried to, to explain why they developed differently and how they would uh, evolve also in very different directions. And he, um, his approach was kind of, of uh, modernization uh, theory. He, um, told about catching up modernizations that all these states, actually all post-communist states, they uh, encounter this problem of catching up modernization, yeah, to, 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 to become like the West. Yeah, to, uh, and um, this agenda was implemented differently in different in these three post-Soviet republics. Uh, everywhere uh, he noticed, and probably, probably rightly so, uh, some sort of encounter, clash between uh, center, primarily capital city, and province, capital city which was more advanced and which was more uh, reformist, reform-minded, and a province, periphery, which was much more conservative, very often pro-Soviet or Sovietophile, uh, and so on, very resistant uh, against any uh, modernization, which is uh, largely equal to westernization in our, in our part of the world. So uh, he uh, told, he wrote that, you know, in uh, Russia, 
uh, center actually uh, won over periphery, uh, but at the cost of authoritarian uh, consolidation. So uh, they promoted this modernization agenda, but in, un uh, in uh, under authoritarian guise. Uh, be because uh, they had to suppress parliament in 1993, they had actually shoot uh, into the parliament and introduced very authoritarian constitution. Yeltsin introduced constitution was basically very, very uh, undemocratic. <coughs> uh, he did not benefit much from this constitution himself, but he opened the door for Putin to, to, to benefit, fully benefit from this Yeltsin's um, uh, authoritarian uh, constitution. Uh, so the victory was purely uh, modernizing center won, but at the cost of, of uh, authoritarianism. Uh, in Belarus, the opposite happened. Uh, the capital city was very weak, uh, civil society was rather weak, and periphery won. Very conservative, and not incidentally, this uh, head of collective farm, Mr. Lukashenko, became president and introduced a whole set of neo-Soviet policies. Uh, so it was a kind of, of conservative neo-Soviet revenge in Belarus. Ukraine, he uh, claimed, uh, represented the most complicated uh, case because uh, also in Ukraine we can observe this uh, encounter, this conflict between modernizing center and conservative Sovietophile, uh, often reactionary periphery. But uh, Furman noticed that this periphery in Ukraine is uh, uh, constrained within only part of, of the country. It's mostly industrial southeast, which was most, more, more Soviet of But the capital city, in the case of Ukraine, has quite a natural ally in, uh, in the West. Western periphery uh, appeared to be different from Eastern periphery and became natural ally of the capital city in this modernization uh, efforts. So he predicted that Ukraine has probably better chances than two other East Slavonic republics for, for, to, to, to get uh, democratized. And uh, ultimately, he um, appeared to be uh, right. Uh, even though uh, this, you know, Ukrainian uh, split, uh, identity split, and uh, sometimes uh, territorial regional split is largely misinterpreted. This uh, example of such a misinterpretation. So please don't take this map seriously. It's uh, like a, for me, it's like a caricature. But it comes from very reputable German newspapers. This is how they represent the uh, idea of two Ukraines. Absolutely, absolutely wrong. There is no Dnieper uh, River doesn't divide anything except for two two, la two uh, banks of, <laughs> of of the river. Um, but it reflects some more fundamental idea: electoral divide, which is really quite uh, stable in Ukraine. At least it was uh, in two uh, thousands. Uh, orange, so-called Orange Ukraine, which was more pro-Ukraine, pro pro-Western, and, um, and more uh, pro, pro, I don't know, maybe not pro-Russian, but Sovietophile, yeah, the southeastern Ukraine. Uh, this is a, this is uh, electoral map. Yes, it's, uh, it has some uh, uh, relation to rea reality, uh, and this um, and this line is much more um, uh, serious. Because this is a line of, uh, this is a southeastern border of historical Polish Lithuanian Commonwealth. This actually when this you know, Polish state uh, ended, which existed in uh, 15, 17, uh, actually up to 18th century. Uh, so we can speak here about some historical legacy, cultural legacy, about some institutional uh, memory and, and so on, so, which is quite different. Uh, because uh, these lands were colonized uh, in, throughout the 19th century and uh, Russian Empire actually was the only, uh, only uh, legitimate source of uh, authority, of modernization and so on. Uh, here loyalty was mixed, yeah, because the uh, Russian Empire was not the only uh, legitimate power there. There were uh, many more different powers before that and many different <coughs> cultural um, uh, memories. Uh, so, uh, well, well, this political uh, consequences of such a uh, simplification, um, which are quite quite dangerous from my point of view, because they mis misinterpret reality, especially especially this uh, animal, uh, which actually is not so active as this one. <laughs> so it's, this competition is not absolutely uh, on the same level. In one case, we can speak about soft power, and here is quite hard power. But anyway, um, 
I prefer to speak, uh, uh, to conceptualize Ukraine rather in this way, in terms of historical legacies, because it's, uh, um, not, it reflects not only this you know, polish lithuanian uh, divide from the 17th, 18th century border, border but also uh, Western part, which was least Sovietized because it, uh, belonged, it became Soviet only after the Second World War, or during the Second World War. Uh, so of course, uh, this is probably the only territory of Ukraine where um, colonial power was not really colonial. It was uh, territory which was occupied, but, but colonial dominance was not uh, internalized. I believe that the most important legacy here was, of course, uh, of Habsburg Empire, because it was constitutional empire, which uh, uh, carried out parliamentary elections and multi-party system, and so So it was very, 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 uh, very suitable for development of civil society there. But also Polish uh, state, interwar state, which uh, controls this territory between the First and Second World War, was also, it was authoritarian, but it was not totalitarian. So there were also some political pluralism and uh, uh, there was some space for Ukrainian parties, etc. Uh, etc. Et so, of course, this, uh, there, is, uh, there are substantial differences between these three regions, even though there are differences also within these regions, but I wouldn't uh, go deeper into this story. Uh, unfortunately, we have now uh, two regions which are occupied now, so they are excluded from any uh, opinion surveys and, and, and so on. Um, and um, finally, um, a little bit. Uh, about um, and this is my last uh, last point. Um, pluralists by default still resist in Ukraine, but uh, we have uh, a good chances for um, democratic consolidation because uh, Ukrainians uh, Ukrainians did not become more Ukrainian speaking. We still have this fundamental uh, bilingualism. In Ukraine, but uh, Ukraine became increasingly monoethnic uh, because just because of uh, rare redefinition, rare identification. Uh, th this is new. This is not new process. Uh, this process began since 1991 because uh, many uh, Ukraine for centuries uh, was um, colonized, kind of settler colonization, and many people uh, intermixed, uh, intermarried. And because of this, uh, after this, you know, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, um, nationality was not prescribed. Because probably you know that in the Soviet Union, nationality was mandatory. Uh, it was ref reflected in passport, and it could not be changed. It, it could be only well, it, ca it can be chosen between fathers and mothers' uh, nationality, but not. But this was the only way. Now we don't have this entry in passports, and people could choose any identity they wished, you know, uh, uh, which meant that many people uh, really defined themselves, even in the 1990s, as Ukrainians, just because there was no pressure to be Russians anymore, it was, it was okay. So we had a loss of uh, ethnic Russians in, uh, in um, censuses from, uh, from 1989 through 2001, 5%, from 22% of ethnic Russians to 17% of ethnic Russians. So they, don't, they did not immigrate. They just, you know, re-identify themselves as Ukrainians. Uh, the, this process con continued. Now we didn't have new censuses because of this, you know, obvious reasons, but we have a lot of opinion surveys. And today we have, uh, according to the last opinion surveys, we have only 5% of people who define themselves as ethnic Russians. Partly because uh, we lost a lot of them in Donbass and Crimea. It was probably half of Russian uh, ethnic population lived there. Uh, but also because uh, of this, you know, uh, mixed legacy, so people can identify themselves either with grandparents, Ukrainian grandparents, or Russian grandmothers. So it's, it depends. And more and more people prefer to. So it, it's a kind of political identification. So they, they still they remain, they remain, no, they remain normal Russian speaking people. The Ukraine is 30%, I would say is in public. Maybe at home there are more Russian, Ukraine speakers, but in public, in big cities, it's predominantly Russian. Uh, but ethnically, it becomes uh, more, um, more and more Ukrainian. And what is interesting is all these people, they gradually become uh, more and more loyal to all things Ukraine. So this is probably one of unexpected uh, results of, of Russian invasion. Uh, I would give you a very interesting example. You can see this, you know, three major groups here in Ukraine. 
uh, sociologists usually define Ukrainian society not for, uh, for divide not for ethnic uh, Russian and Ukrainians, but for Ukrainian speaking Ukrainians, Russian speaking Ukrainians, and ethnic Russians. Actually, this is the smallest group. The two major groups in Ukraine are Russian speaking Ukrainians and Ukrainian speaking Ukrainians. And what is interesting is that you um, take a look at uh, their uh, development of their attitudes. Here is one, one question which is, uh, there are many more questions like this, but this question uh, seems to be very graphical, very illustrative. Um, it was about independence. If there was a referendum on Ukraine's independence now, would you support it or not? And you can see that uh, all these three groups, they uh, increase their support for uh, independence. Of course, to, it's still different, yes? You see the highest support within this group, and you see the lowest support within this group. But still, still you know, within all these three groups, you can see dynamics, uh, growing dynamics, growing support everywhere. And what is also very interesting is that within one year, before the war and during the war, the growth was as high or even higher than within the previous 12 years. Just compare figures. You know, one year uh, resulted, uh, brought higher support than 12 past years. So dynamic, so you know, the direction did not change. It was the same since independence. But dynamics uh, accelerated rapidly. So uh, the last picture, and, and we'll stop here. Uh, the last picture is, uh, I believe, is also very uh, illustrative because it shows how uh, actually <coughs> illustrates the same figures which are uh, in the, well, in the previous uh, picture. Uh, this uh, graph, uh, this diagram, illustrates um, how. Uh, pro-Western, you know, pro-Western, pro pro-Russian attitudes uh, changed in Ukraine. Uh, this is so-called uh, uh, house, uh, house hat, yeah? uh, which reflects probability of this or that or this attitude. So if you if you have, for example, this point zero, kind of neutral point, and this is uh, more and more and more and more pro pro-Russian, and this is more and more and more pro-Western attitude. So if you take this, this uh, axis any specific attitude, uh, which is quantified by number of questions, uh, you may find here probability of, of this attitude among uh, different groups, Ukrainian-speaking Ukrainians, uh, Russian-speaking and uh, Ukrainians and ethnic Russians. So you can see these three groups, they are uh, painted in different colors. Uh, the dotted line uh, refers to the period before the war, and the whole line refers to the period uh, after the war. Uh, so you can see here that they are different. This, uh, these curves do not coincide, which is obviously yeah? this uh, red line refers to ethnic Russians. They, of course, they tend to be more pro-Russian than um, uh, purple line uh, Russian-speaking Ukrainians and blue line uh, Ukrainian-speaking. They are different, yeah? they have different attitudes. They overlap, but they largely overlap. This is also very important. And after the war, all three curves, all, all three groups shifted uh, into the, to, to the left, which means uh, to more pro-Western direction. I believe this is a very good explanation why Ukraine did not collapse after, after Russian invasion. This is also a good explanation why uh, it still uh, persists and, uh, and is not split. So, uh, Ukrainians are very different in their uh, ethnicity and in their attitudes, and these three groups uh, still, they have, you know, they are different. You can see this curve, they don't overlap completely. So, you can't say that this is, you know, unified nation, like something like this. No, they are different. But, but it's important they overlap to a degree, and they shift into the same direction, so probably this um, gives some, you know, prospects for, for national consolidation and for forming uh, of uh, political identity, civic identity in Ukraine. Uh, which means that um, some uh, new um, kind of democracy can be institutionalized, which is based on, not on this you know, pluralism by default, but uh, uh, built upon uh, some more fundamental civic, uh, civic values, civic attitudes. Uh, and uh, I feel that this process is pending in Ukraine. Uh, despite the resistance of the ancien regime, I gave you an example of such resistance, 
uh, but this ancien regime is squeezed by two different and very powerful forces, by civil society from below and by uh, international community, international donors actually, because they credit Ukraine uh, from, from above. Uh, it's like, you know, like, like a sandwich. So they, they resist, they sabotage, they, they don't want to do this, but they are forced to do this. And uh, slowly but steadily the country moves uh, forward and there are a lot of important reforms which were implemented or are still pending and I hope there is no, uh, no way uh, back or, or outside. Um, but no, I'll answer your questions. Thank you. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Ruchuk. Uh, so after your talk.